I believe that uh, we're going to have a discussion which promises to be very, very interesting on uh, uh, investment in Greek real estate. I believe that at the end of the discussion, everyone here will have uh, viable information, so please be sure to stay until the end. Uh, Greek economy has witnessed a remarkable turnaround in the recent years uh, and has emerged as a vibrant hub for both domestic and international investors. Uh, the Greek real estate market, of course, has followed that trend, uh, assisted from the increased capital flows uh, in a country derived from the economic recovery and the governmental policies and reforms. So is Greece the place to go for real estate investments? Uh, we're going to answer all these questions, and I'm very privileged uh, to moderate uh, a panel with very, very distinguished uh, panelists that I'm now going to present. So. Uh, from your left to right, uh, Mr. Nikos Dimtsas, Chief Investment Officer at Demand. Uh, Mr. Marinos Yanopoulos, CEO of uh, Enterprise Greece. Ms. Dika Rapitidou, Director of Athens Economics and JLL Alliance Partner in Greece. And Mr. Tassos Kazinos, CEO of Trustoric. Okay, so uh, you will allow me to start from... Uh, Mr. Yanopoulos, Marino, uh, the slogan remains the same, invest in Greece, and the question remains the same, why Greece? I think we've been, today, this uh, question has been answered a lot, especially from the, from the minister. Uh, he gave his keynote speech. Uh, Greece is the success story. We have a, a rebound, a re transformation. Uh, Greece has been going through uh, many reforms that have actually helped achieve uh, what we're talking about today, what we're talking about the investment grade for uh, all the credit rating agencies. Uh, it's been a pain, painstaking, I think, in the sense that uh, this government, and that showed us again with the, with the elections, with the second uh, term, that uh, people believe in that, those reforms that took place, and they actually have something to look forward to, because uh, the investors, what they look for is stability. And uh, having said that, in this uh, economic environment, with uh, war, with uh, inflation, I think uh, Greece is a safe place currently for people to come and invest. Uh, there's been many reforms with uh, tax reductions, with tax incentives for uh, investments, for strategic investments, if you like. We can talk about that later if you want. Uh, the, a huge process of digitalization of all the processes that an investor or a company to run in Greece that will be taking place. We, we would like to say that we went from uh, a red tape to a red carpet, making it easy for investors to, to come. Uh, and I think it's this combination of, of, of efforts from all the different uh, stakeholders in Greece that allowed the, the, the actual investors and the company to come and invest, uh, not just in real estate, which is the, the, the talk of this panel, but in every aspect of, of the business. So I think Overall, is that, is that reform that made that rebound possible? It's, it's a rebound. It's not. It's coming back. Uh, so I think that's where we, we lie. Okay. Thank you for that very interesting uh, introductory remark. But let's let's see things on a wider perspective. So uh, we can establish that Greece is a good option for investors. But you know, investors allow me the expression are looking for enemies because better is the enemy of good, as a proverb says. So um, how Greek market compares, let me, Nico, ask you that question, how the Greek market compares with the European in terms of performance? Uh, thank you, Yanni. Uh, and I would also like to thank Olga and uh, Nico Bornozzi for the invitation <coughs> in this panel. Um, yes, um, there are quite significant differences between Greece and uh, mostly the Western European countries because uh, one, we are at a different phase of the real estate market cycle. Greece for a couple of years had, um, let's say, was in crisis, so there was undersupply, which was not the case in Western Europe, and uh, the yields were high enough in the past. So, as we also heard in the bonds, 
this year the, the Greek market was the only one that bond yields dropped relative to past year versus Europe. The same uh, uh, applied to real estate yields as well. Uh, and prices and values in Greece are relatively lower compared to Western European countries. So another one, another reason for the good performance of uh, Greek real estate in the past two years, and I believe it will continue, uh, is the RRF fund. Because RRF acts like a hedging to the rising interest rates. And maybe we will elaborate more in the panel, but I will pass the floor again to Yanni. OK. Uh, so uh, just to continue that conversation right now, so we all understand that there are particular benefits in the, in the Greek market that uh, someone can benefit of. But let's shift the discussion to Ms. Agapitidou Dika. Uh, can I ask you, what are the drivers of the Greek real estate market? And uh, more specifically, are those drivers the same for commercial and residential market? Well, thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy and honored to, uh, to be here today. Um, the, the, uh, the drivers of the, the Greek real estate market fall into two categories. It's the macro factors, which have been extensively discussed this morning in various uh, sessions. And it's the micro factors. And we're talking here about the basics, which is supply and demand. As mentioned by Mr. Dim just now, um, there was an undersupply, uh, a long undersupply during the long financial crisis uh, and confidence crisis that we faced. And uh, the whole of real estate sector uh, went through some very difficult times. Uh, but this seems to be over, and the, the real estate sector is not just rebounding, uh, it's coming up very, very strongly. And the, uh, the distinction to make between the residential and commercial sector is not too broad because they, they both, uh, they're both underpinned by the, the lack of supply and high demand. So in, in both sectors, broad sectors, commercial, real estate, and residential, uh, we have this um, feature of demand pushing up prices quite a bit. And the origins of demand are a bit different because for residential, the residential sector, they come from uh, abroad. It's domestic and overseas. Whereas for commercial real estate, it's basically domestic. There's a lot of competition among the various institutions in, in Greece. So uh, high demand, uh, low supply, and competition are the drivers behind this um, real estate rebound. We're witnessing and higher prices and higher rents. But I need to point out that despite the rebound, we have yet to reach the price levels that the market experienced uh, during uh, 2008, uh, 2007 and 8. So there's still some way to go, I believe. Just to continue and expand that, that question, um, which are the sectors that are the front runners in terms of their performance, the rental levels and the returns? Mm -hmm. Well, everybody's favorites these days is the hospitality sector and logistics. So hospitality has also been uh, discussed in uh, this um, uh, conference. The, uh, the, the favorite, the favorite um, asset class for uh, investors is to buy a hotel which needs to be reconfigured and properly managed. So to add value to existing assets. Uh, because um, investors have found that uh, buying green fields is not the best way to actually produce something worthwhile fast. So it's easier for investors to acquire an existing hotel and try to reconfigure and reposition it. Um, so hospitality is definitely a front runner. Logistics is a close second. Uh, logistics uh, was actually a latecomer in, uh, in the real estate market in Greece. 
at a time when it was uh, doing really well in the rest of Europe and in the United States, Greece was quite dormant in this respect. And uh, I'm proud to say that our company was behind the first institu institutional investment back in uh, 2014 for uh, logistics space. People did not actually believe in it as a sector. It's come a long way since then, and today it is extremely hot. So logistics is the, the second, uh, uh, the runner-up. So these are the two front runners, yes. Hospitality and logistics today. Uh, let's focus on logistics, um, because you hear a lot about their performance. Do you think that they can retain their momentum in the medium and the long term? Are you talking yeah. to me? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, because uh, there is a lot of pending demand. For example, we as a company, we have about 10, that's the ratio, we have 10 companies looking for space versus one or two landlords that need to dispose of their space. So yes, there's a lot of backlog, so we see that continuing. And we see that continuing not only in Greater Athens, but also in Thessaloniki, which has gradually become uh, another point of interest. Its growing momentum is there. And so Thessaloniki is uh, almost equally interesting at the, at the moment. Mm. Very interesting. OK, so uh, Tasso, um, I could ask you if uh, you agree with what we already said, but you have recently announced uh, a share capital increase, a 75 million share capital increase, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So um, instead of asking you how do you see the real estate market going forward, I will ask you what do you intend to do? What is trust or focus on real estate investments? What are your plans? Yeah, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for uh, uh, sticking late into the conference to listen to our panel. Um, indeed, a couple of weeks ago, our uh, general meeting of shareholders approved and authorized our board to proceed with the 75 million share capital increase. We're in the process of approving that prospectus, and we expect to get it all uh, done by end of January. Now, that's just sort of one, one part of it that we've been uh, uh, doing um, uh, in the last year. This um, uh, issue is on top of a 55 million uh, e uh, cash injection that we received in late uh, 2022, early 2023, um, in the form of a mandatory convertible loan from our majority shareholder, Piraeus Bank, um, that has uh, uh, basically fully been deployed. Now, a little bit about uh, uh, our growth and then um, which asset classes we're looking at. Basically, we increased um, uh, during this period our GAV from about um, uh, 325 million in 2021. Uh, we expect to uh, reach about 500 million by the end of this year. Um, 600 million by the end of 2024 and about 725 million um, so sort of the year after. Now our investment strategy for the deployment of all this uh, capital and uh, what we're planning to uh, look at um, with a new round of investments, it's pretty much consistent I think with what we've been doing over the last two, three years which is prime office with value add uh, features, similarly I think to what uh, Vigas was saying about hospitality investments but on the office segment, as well as um, uh, logistics and especially logistics with uh, a green uh, component. Now we've uh, actually identified those two asset classes, deliver us robust and sort of uh, healthy um, uh, yields as well as uh, uh, attractive fair value gains. So we consider uh, 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 deploying and continuing our investment in those two uh, sectors. The other thing um, I think that um, attracts our attention is um, in a green transition of our building. So we got about a 45 million CapEx plan, um, both in terms of uh, a new office uh, building, um, Gold Lead certified, as well as the repositioning of three existing buildings into energy efficient uh, standards. Um, we aim to have about 25% of our portfolio in uh, green uh, certified assets within the next uh, two or three years. And then uh, last but not least, I think um, although we see our uh, medium term growth um, uh, continuing along the uh, two asset axes that I've just mentioned, um, we think that's just not enough in order to kind of uh, deliver a sustainable growth um, in our platform. 
Um, so we have an ongoing uh, discussion about defining what we call like the third pillar of our investments. We haven't yet decided whether this would be um, hospitality, healthcare, education, or residential, which is being very methodical, I think, and, um, and kind of in our analysis and our approach. But something I would like to refer to a little bit uh, maybe later in, uh, in our panel is um, you know, maybe some changes to the RIC law that would facilitate RICs um, doing more investments, like, like in hospitality which is a very kind of uh, important asset class, but one that uh, we have not been able to unlock yeah, definitely. Uh, successfully definitely. so far. Very interesting, very interesting points. So I think that uh, right now we have established that uh, the interplay of tourism, which is the crown jewel of the Greek economy, along with retail, the residential market, the commercial market, offices, logistics, creates uh, an, an extensive range of opportunities uh, for investors in Greece and that no one can disagree um, about that. So uh, despite the, uh, the inflationary uh, cycle that uh, an economy can, can have. So uh, let's return the discussion to, to you, uh, Marino. And uh, recently, Enterprise Greece uh, received an award. It was recognized as the best national investment agency for 2023. Uh, can you give us a background for uh, what exactly led uh, in, uh, Enterprise Greece uh, to, to receive that, that award and uh, how exactly an investment uh, can benefit from the fast track processes of Enterprise Greece? Thank you for mentioning that. We haven't planned this, by the way. Uh, it's because basically in 22 we had more than 2.3 billion uh, uh, worth of strategic investments coming into Greece that came through Enterprise Greece, along with all the uh, other efforts that we've been trying to do and uh, being as a one-stop service and consultant to many projects that uh, they took in Greece that we helped uh, facilitate. Uh, basically, uh, I think that due to the success has also to come back to what I was saying before, the success story, because it makes at, at least my uh, life easier in the sense that I can promote Greece, I can uh, set the environment of uh, Greece being a, a great investment destination, and uh, be able to work together with uh, local partners as well. Uh, Nico's here with me, we've been together to uh, many other panels, but not only that, we actually uh, go to MIPIM together, for example, where uh, demand comes and other partners that are here as well, we have something to say, we have something to sell, we have something to promote. Uh, I think that in combination with, uh, again, going back to what I said before, the reforms with the RRF, uh, because let's not forget, we, are, we had the, um, the largest kind of pool out of the fund in Greece, and having be able to utilize these funds is, is something amazing, having the inflation and the cost of uh, the really high interest rates at the moment. Now, coming back to strategic investments, uh, in, in an ideal world, the strategic investment would be needed because the investor would come. But having the investments, the incentives in place, uh, really helps facilitate that. Uh, the, the three major uh, categories that can be uh, provided as incentives, first of all, is the fast track process uh, that considerably cuts time and helps with all the licensing and all. Uh, you know, the, uh, the things that we needed for, for a project to start. The second one is all the financial incentives that a project uh, can get from tax incentives to uh, cash grants through the RRF and the, the emblematic uh, investments. And the third one, which I think is the, the more uh, relatable one for this panel, is the, uh, the spatial law called ESHASE, which is essentially a tool that we can use uh, through Enterprise Greece and, uh, uh, to be able to go on top of any existing uh, spatial, uh, municipal, or communal in general uh, in, in, in Greece. Uh, but, but as I said, uh, as well, is the product is there. Uh, we see a turn from uh, special hospitality, which, as we know, is the largest uh, contributor to that fact. It's more than 30% of the GDP. And, and also, I think, Something which is, we haven't been mentioned uh, is the, the, the huge privatization program that Greece is undergoing through, which is some huge uh, projects coming. It's uh, especially Saloniki and in Athens, and it's regarding to logistics as well. 
And I think along with the infrastructure, the marinas and everything that's been going on in Greece will really help kind of encompass all this environment together to be able to go even further from that. Thank you very much. So uh, the good with enterprise Greece is that the fast track strategic investment process is a, is a process that has been tested and works. So the, I believe that this is the important part of it. So uh, Nico, can we return a little bit on, uh, on, on market specifics and uh, your demand right now has a portfolio of uh, uh, projects under development that uh, are expected to generate a GDP of uh, exceeding 1 billion, if I'm not mistaken. You're and right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, and uh, I would agree that, uh, as Marinos pointed out, <laughs> that the, the major infrastructure projects uh, are a big key to the dynamic evolution of the Greek market. At the same time, as Tassos pointed out earlier, the, the vertical alignment of the industry with uh, environmental sustainability uh, is considered a key factor. To which extent do you agree with that, and how does it relate with your projects underway? Yes, uh, sustainability is very, very important. <coughs> we heard it from the banking sector and the banking panel as well. Um, we started our first green building back in 2009, and it was the first certified lead gold building in Greece uh, in 12, 2012. And um, we used to talk about a green premium and uh, now we should talk about a brown discount because of the decarbonization cost that eventually will catch up all uh, investors and all communities. Second, it is very important all corporates have ESG agendas and the ESG imperative is dominant, which means that you cannot develop in, in real estate any type of uh, building, be it office or logistics, as Dika said, without it being green or having sustainable characteristics. And um, this is very, very important. To link this with the RRF funds, real estate in general is not eligible for subsidies or other kind of, uh, let's say, contributions. But under the green transition, uh, tool, let's say, of the RRF, you can have loans of uh, 15 to 20 years with uh, fixed interest rates and low interest rates. So this is a hedging to the uh, floating part, which is uh, jointly uh, lent by the systemic banks. So all these features have the green element at the back, and this is very important, and we totally focus on that in demand. Also, the product one, one developer creates, develops, will not be uh, sold uh, or will not be let if it doesn't have uh, the green characteristics. It's, it's very important because the REITs like Trustor need to have a green portfolio. The tenants, which are big national or multinational companies, need to address the green imperative. So it's something that is critical. However, I understand that the shift that has happened with environmental sustainability is that now it's not, it's not, it's not just anymore a tick box exercise that someone has, has to follow uh, to comply with standards, with an agenda, with an investment policy. I understand that it is a driving force for performance in real estate. Is that correct? Yes, it is because what I didn't mention is that occupiers, the users of the buildings, have big benefits through their operation. So the exercise is not anymore how much is the rent. It's what's the running cost of a building. And this includes, apart from the rent, the uh, utilities costs, which are hugely reduced uh, if the building is sustainable. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Capitido, can I also further elaborate and ask you a question on how important is, important is now location for, yeah, well, for real estate? 
Yeah, it remains very important. We used to say that in real estate, uh, everything is about location, location, location. However, this is taking a back seat these days more and more because uh, other criteria like sustainability, quality and wellness of the employees, of the staff working in the buildings uh, is becoming more and more important. So sustainable buildings are the ones attracting higher rents. They're the ones uh, being uh, easier for lenders to lend, and they're the ones that investors prefer. So all in all, it's a winning combination. It's much easier to talk about sustainable buildings, though, in the commercial real estate sector than residential. Uh, we, we find it extremely hard for owners of small apartments or even medium-sized apartments to actually convert them into greener premises. It is extremely difficult. It costs a lot of money. The transition cost is really a pain and a big challenge for most people. And in Greece, we have many apartment blocks. And in apartment blocks, you need to have everybody's full endorsement in order to proceed with such a transition. And that is a big challenge. So I reckon that for commercial real estate, yes, green buildings are the future and the present, if you like. But for residential buildings, the existing stock is difficult to make it to uh, a greener and asset class. It's very, very challenging. If I may interrupt, I just read an article from McKinsey, and they said that through AI, there is a way to figure out, in a much cheaper way, what has to be done to, to transit uh, an old building to a green building. So we see the effect of AI even in real estate, which is a traditional industry. And it's a very interesting article. Sorry about that. Actually, that interruption was excellent because this is what I want to link. So uh, real estate is, uh, is being seen as, uh, let's say, a traditional asset class. So uh, just to expand the question, and uh, uh, this is a question for you, Mr. Um, Capitido. Um, Real estate is a traditional asset class, but are there are niche markets uh, where real estate could, could have growth potential for investors? Well, yes, there are. But, you know, in, in, in Greece, we, we sort of lag behind a little bit when we um, are to catch on, on to a new market. My, my own favorite is senior housing with the demographics being what they are in Greece, in the whole of Europe for, fa for a fact, but in Greece as well. I think senior housing is a big, <clears throat> is a big answer to, uh, to the question of how we deal with older people and their housing requirements. And studies have shown that housing plus um, doctors and nurses and what have you, all the help that an old person needs cost much more than actual residence in a senior housing uh, facility. Um, for cultural reasons, I believe this has yet to uh, become uh, a proper uh, asset class that is interesting to, to Greeks. But I believe that it is only a matter of time for this culture to change. Not least because in senior housing, um, older people can interact and have some social life. And also they have um, doctors um, on call. So that is my own personal favorite. I think it will take some time, but I think, I think eventually it will become an asset class in its own merit in Greece as well. Definitely. I believe that I would agree with you. The cultural buyer here is, has affected that uh, development a lot. What do you believe, Nikos? Are there other alternative uh, real estate uh, fields that we could develop yes. in Greece? We call them alternative real estate because the standard ones are commercial real estate, office, retail and logistics, and resi. So what I believe is um, the biggest uh, demand at this time in Greece is data centers, which of course are built on land. And we see that um, uh, all the big um, uh, 
collocators try to establish data centers in Greece. Uh, some do on their own, like Microsoft, but others look for real estate partners. And this is a big opportunity. I could also identify studios because we've heard in an earlier panel that the rebate policy of the Greek uh, uh, state has brought demand for studios in Greece. So these are also alternative investments. And of course, student accommodation. Some REITs try to uh, create such a portfolio. So there are other alternative, let's say, real estate investments. Among those, however, the ones with a bigger impact will be data centers because of the size. A 20 megawatt uh, data center would cost around 220 million. So this, in terms of real estate, is, is a huge size. Thank you very much. So mining time, uh, too many opportunities, Tassos, uh, in the market, but individual portfolios uh, have a lot of disadvantages, or to put it another way, collective investment schemes have significant advantages. It's professional management, uh, it's uh, access to investments that are not possible for individual portfolios, access to leverage not possible for individual portfolios. RICs, real estate investment companies such as Trustor, and of course other alternative investment schemes, uh, could be a very lac lucrative, indirect way for someone to invest um, in the real estate uh, market. Uh, there is an ongoing discussion for uh, amending the law of, of RICs. And I would like your views uh, about that initiative and how you think. Uh, that an amendment in the law could help and enhance the framework for uh, the real estate investing com companies? No, thanks for that question. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is an initiative that we started about a year ago together with uh, Noval and Prodea, two of the other uh, leading Greeks in Greece. And I think the genesis of it was that we were finding difficulties in closing hospitality investments. and. Um, and in a nutshell, the problem is that the Greek Greek law, which also is the case in some other jurisdictions, does not allow the Greeks <coughs> to have any revenue that is derived from anything else but a long-term lease. So effectively, we can only buy assets and prop costs. Now, when it comes to hotel transactions, I mean, the first problem is that you just can't get the deals because Typically, the hotels in Greece are owned by an individual that is in the family that also runs the operation. So they have very little incentive, mainly a tax incentive, to create an opco and a propco structure and separate basically the operation from, from the asset. So the, one of the major things is that we just couldn't find suitable deals. The second one is that once you're pursuing a transaction, you need to have an operator attached. Um, so, uh, presumably, people, we would, everybody, all the larger rigs would want to work with an international brand. The international brands would not consider long-term lease agreements, but the classic management agreements. So, in a way, when you are in a competitive process, you have to bring those two pieces together at the same time. Find a willing seller of just the real estate, and at the same time, have an operator attached. Now, all of that made closing a transaction very, very difficult, especially in a competitive environment. And also, it created a price disadvantage for, uh, for RICS. Now, um, the answer, uh, and I think if you look at the number of uh, hotel investments that RICS have done, you will see it's one of the smallest sort of percentages in terms of their total portfolio, while hotel transactions is by far the largest um, in terms of volume of real estate transactions in Greece. So what's the, what's the answer to this? I mean, we, you can see examples in a lot of other countries in other jurisdictions whereby they updated the legislation to allow RICs to have also operating companies that are taxed under a different normal kind of regime. And therefore, they allow RICs to take operating companies, separate the assets, do the restructuring, hold the real estate under the normal RIC envelope, and then um, have a, either a JV or an operating outfit that's uh, run as a normal SA. Um, and we think that this is not just limited to hotels, but I will give you another example, which I think might make it very meaningful when it comes to the green transition. 
So there's a new environmental law in Greece which stipulates that for all new builds, 30% of the rooftop must be covered with uh, uh, photovoltaic panels. So if you take an example of a large uh, logistic investment, 20,000, 30,000 square meters, maybe even more, so the amount of electricity that you can generate is more than enough from what you would need for own use. So what do you do with the rest? If you can't sell it to the grid or, or sort of pass it on, then effectively you're forcing the rig to make a substantial investment into creating this infrastructure, but at the same time you're restricting them from generating revenue, revenue out of this. So um, I think the, um, uh, the main changes of the, of, the, uh, of the thrust of the changes to the law that we are proposing is basically to allow rigs to have um, uh, uh, operating companies and these ancillary revenues. Because I think it's not just about uh, allowing us to make more money, but I think it's a framework from 1999 that needs updating. It would facilitate and uh, even and strengthen the institutionalization of ownership of real estate assets, including um, hotels. But also, it would align the new environmental uh, law together with the REIC law. And uh, I think they would just further galvanize and promote green transition if you actually can use the existing rooftops. Of, uh, of buildings as opposed to um, you know, uh, uh, putting aside uh, new land and new land uses in order to develop these photovoltaic parks. Very, very insightful points. I would add on top of that that the, the alternative investment funds frame will also have some restrictions that prevent practically alternative investment funds focusing solely on real estate. And it's, it's kind of odd of having foreign alternative real estate funds coming and investing into Greek real estate assets because of the restrictions of the Greek law. Uh, I believe we're out of time, so I would like to thank you, everyone. Uh, I believe that at the end of the day, it was a pitch for Greek real estate market. Uh, we can all agree that we ended up that discussion as promised with a wealth of information. So thank you very much.